Amen. Amen and amen. Well, so glad to be in the house of the Lord this morning, to be in a country and a, that we can come together right. and worship God. Amen. I, it's just amazing how what freedoms we have and um, how complacent we can get, isn't it, in our, in our freedoms. Take them for granted. Well, let's uh, pick up again today, uh, as in the days of Noah, in this teaching as I try to move uh, right along in uh, sharing some information uh, with us, with these prophetic people from a prophetic angle. Um, uh, you can say, well, Alan, what do you mean by that? We're always looking for what God's doing right under the surface. You've got those things that you can see. Then you've got God doing things behind the scenes that we can't see, but we can know by his word what he's doing. So let's uh, watch this as we go. As in the days of Noah, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. So we're doing a comparison of in the days of Noah and then in the, these days that we're living in. We went over, uh, we go over and we look at, as being a prophetic people, different signs, different uh, revelation of the Spirit that God gives us to see where we are. Revelation of the Spirit to see where you are as an individual, as a person, uh, and your relationship with God and also how we are as a nation with our relationship with God and as the world seen is in a relationship with God. So in this, the, greatest, the greater sign of the last days, and this is important, everybody's looking for signs. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. So deception, uh, I kind of have a mixed feeling about deception. <laughs> uh, one is, uh, why did God allow it to be so easily deceived? Uh, I'm like, well, God, if this thing is so dangerous... Uh, isn't deception too readily available? <laughs> and so it, it, it looks like um, it would, um, it's easy to be deceived according to the scriptures. And there again, I have mixed feelings. I wonder, well, God, why did you make it to where we could be so easily deceived? And uh, because it is very taxing to look around all the time and see if you're being deceived or not. And then people say, you're paranoid, <laughs> right? <laughs> or you're just paranoid. And uh, so, I, so it's, a, it's a battle of being deceived or not deceived or looking at what's deceiving us. But this much I do know, I don't know why, I just do know that Jesus answered and said, take heed that no man deceive you, which lets me know that the probability of this happening is probably pretty high. The only thing I can come up with is I'm just in a foreign land. I'm in a foreign country. And uh, this country that we're living in, this world was given over uh, by our ancestors. And uh, I am convinced that we would have all done the same thing. I don't know if you are or not, but I'm pretty much convinced that we would have done the same thing as Adam and Eve. And that's the reason I believe we've got the same consequence. Uh, but deception is a huge deal. It's a big deal. I, you know, I feel even, I don't know, I have mixed feelings on having a year-long series on deception. <laughs> I mean, when I, I mean, every time I go to the book every week, I'm like, God, don't we need to be drawing this thing to a close, or don't we need to... And I son of a gun, and then he gives me the next thing. And, and then he, he just does it week at a time. It's just the next thing. I'm, I just sit down, have an open mind. And my petition the last uh, two months to God is, uh, are we wa wrapping it up today? <laughs> and it just hasn't happened. And uh, so uh, I'm not taking credit for this long series on deception. Uh, I'll not take credit for it if you see anything, and I'll not take credit for it if you get tired of it. 
Now let's look at this. Deception is an act of spiritual warfare. This is, this is what's so important that we understand. There is a thing called spiritual warfare. I, I uh, heard a sermon about a year ago. There was a, there, this one guy was trying to create a movement against spiritual warfare saying that was a false teaching because uh, he was tired of hearing about it. <laughs> he said, he said, I thought, so he, well, I mean, it's the best way if you want to get rid of something, just be deceived and let it uh, change your mind, I guess. But, but just to act like something's not there doesn't mean it's not there. Right. And, and so that is a part in the way that deception works. It's, uh, it's waiting till I always kid Jeff Rowland, a friend of mine, and he has this uh, saying all the time. It's about everything. We, uh, and his comment is always, that gets on my last nerve. That's, that's just his standard. Uh, he's wore his last nerve out. Huh? On how everything just gets on his last, uh, last nerve. And I think this is uh, kind of the way this guy was. He was saying now spiritual warfare was false teaching and all that. And I didn't mind it, but I was just waiting for his, uh, what, this, what do I call this stuff that happens? I need a name. Uh, and he never did uh, do that, so I didn't sign up. Uh, almost uh, every passage in the New Testament contains some kind of warning against being deceived. So here we are using the scriptures to see what's going on. Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Now, Brian uh, came up to me uh, just a little bit ago, and he was talking about this verse of scripture here and says, For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall, shall deceive many. It didn't say, I am Jesus. And Christ, of course, being the anointed one. So there's going to be many uh, that's going to come. And, and the deception is going to be is they're going to say they're the anointed one. And, and uh, it's a good revelation. And I think it's true because you know, the temptation to us as believers today is to think uh, uh, one person's more anointed than another, I guess you could say. And then we even, uh, you know, we have this idea, if I could, we could just get this speaker in, then we'd have more of the anointing and, and, and God would move. And it's how many, amazing how many thousands of dollars has been spent for that end. I just uh, saw a thing on my phone this morning of all the greats of the last uh, 30 years, I guess, or 40 if they're alive. There's like, like 30 people they've called in now for reviving the old fires, I think they call it. And they got every who's who that's been in a revival that's still living uh, coming to this, um, to this uh, conference, I guess you could say, or whatever, thinking, and, and maybe it will, I don't know, but I, I'm not going to say it is or won't, but for us to have this idea that we get all the anointed people in would kind of fit under this verse here, many shall come in my name saying, I am the anointed one. And it's not that the person says it, it's just we think it in our minds. That's where the deception comes in. And, uh, of course, there again, uh, Peter Lord used to always say, uh, how, how uh, he would say, how would you say it? How anointed are you, I think he said? Uh, no, how much like Christ are you, one to ten? <clears throat> Most people would say two, three, or something like that. And then he would say, uh, no, you're a ten. You're a ten. Everybody's a ten, he would say in his Jamaican accent. And if you have Jesus in you, you're a ten. And uh, his point being, everybody, if you have Christ, is you're under the anointing of Christ. And so for he, and then he goes on in this preaching for us to take this this concept that somebody's uh, more anointed than uh, the other. How can you be any more anointed than the anointed one, which is Christ? <clears throat> point being, the focus point is Christ, not the individual, <clears throat> and that we're we all have the same anointing, if you will, if you have Christ in your heart. Now, we're maybe not tapping in on it, but that's another discussion for another day. Now, so <clears throat> I introduced you to this term, uh, psyops, in the last week or so. And um, psyops is psychological warfare or psychological operations is what psyops is. And our military has psyops, people all over the world. It's, it's a known, uh, if you will, battleground of warfare. It's called psyops. And so it's after, in other words, if you're in true war, it's understood that 
most of the wars won before you go to battle. Because it's a psychological thing. You try to psych, psych out your opponent. Uh, if, if you watch boxing or anything, the two guys come up and they're supposed to shake hands and they're, you know, trying to see who looks the meanest, right? And they're trying to psych out their opponent, you know, so to speak. And so psyops is a, is, is a type of warfare, whether you like it or not, it just is. And so then we even see that countries use it. Our military is in all four uh, branches of our military has one arm that's dedicated to nothing but psychological warfare. And so, as I introduced you to that, but also the scriptures was telling us about PSYOPs uh, before the, uh, our military handbook did. And it says, Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. So the part of the deception is psychological warfare, psyops. And he goes on to say this in Colossians. See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy, empty deception, uh, according to the traditions of men, according to the elementary principles of the world, uh, rather than according to Christ. So here the Apostle Paul is saying, and you know, there again, you got once you start seeing that the greatest sign of the end is the deception increases. More deception, more deception. Knowledge increases, and the knowledge and the, the avenues of um, knowledge being uh, communicated is the river in which the deceptions will uh, run. Now, this is a, uh, I thought I'd start us here today on uh, how do you win psychological warfare. Now, there's, a, there's one thing to understand that we're in psychological warfare, the Bible calls it one and the same, spiritual warfare. Uh, it's, it's obvious that we're in spiritual warfare. So I'll interchange the two terms, but it's, uh, it is the same thing. How do, how do you win in psychological warfare or spiritual warfare? Now, I, I mentioned to you this last week, and let's look at it right quickly. Negotiation is a psychological warfare, and those who are most adept at it can impose their will on others while allowing them to imagine the opposite has happened. In other words, the point of negotiations is to get you into a conversation that you negotiate, and then in negotiations you learn to compromise so that the negotiations comes to an end. Now, uh, that definition didn't come out of the Bible. It came out of the Marine Handbook of PSYOPs. That's, that's what they came out of. And, uh, <clears throat> but anyways, that's the purpose of the psychology, so negotiations is a dangerous thing to enter. Only those that are, are, are well can handle negotiations well need to even go into any type of negotiations with the enemy because the enemy will cause you to agree with something and make you think it was your idea. That's what a good negotiator can do. So now the, 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 one of the best negotiators in, on the planet is, is Satan himself and his cohorts which I'm excited about the teaching Trevor's, uh, a series Trevor's getting ready to do on these cohorts, uh, what's happening, our two teachings. Y'all are going to really get it on, uh, uh, on what the devil looks like here in the next few weeks. You got me and Trevor, two different uh, angles, uh, but there's a purpose and a reason in it so that we'll be sharp, we'll not be tossed around by all of this stuff. Now, you can enter the arena of negotiations, but you must not negotiate the truth. I went into that a little deeper, uh, but truth is not uh, your, you don't own it, it's God's truth, and you can't negotiate what's God's, uh, is, is the point. Now, we are in a war, we have to say that now. Psychological warfare is the planned tactical use of propaganda and false information to control the minds of people. That's what psychological warfare is. It's, it is it's, it's, on, it's done on purpose to control your mind. Now, psychological warfare is going on around us just 24-7 now. You have this coming at you through your news. Uh, I hate to say it, but yes, through your government. Uh, people will make you, try to make you believe they're doing uh, you good, uh, but yet it's, it's, they're not your friends. Now, watch this. The purpose is to mislead, intimidate, demoralize, or otherwise influence the thinking or behavior. Now, you see that? The purpose is to mislead, intimidate, demoralize, or otherwise influence the thinking or behavior. When, when you take on a, 
if, if there is an individual in the country or, or in conversation, it can be five or six of us have a conversation about somebody. And in that conversation, if we're all ganging up on one individual uh, and we're having misleading information, we intimidate and we do more lies. Uh, if, we're, if we're in a conversation of five or six people and we're all agreeing on how we're going to demoralize that person, uh, we need to back off from the conversation, take a look at ourselves. Then if you go to five or six groups of people and they're all doing that, uh, uh, you, you, have to, you have to ask yourself, why are so many people concerned about tearing down this one person, this one company, this one country? Why is every, why, what's the deal here? Well, the truth is, you probably got some psychological warfare going on from the dark side. Uh, you just need to consider that. Now, that's called psi war or psychological operations. That's where you get the terminology psyops from. Now, in Ephesians 6, 12, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, against rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. So we can know the culprits behind all of this stuff. If you, if you have an addiction, a drug addiction, or alcohol addiction, any addiction, uh, there's probably a spirit behind it. Now, if it's not an addiction, you're probably just in everyday normal sin. But if you're in habitual sin, there's a good chance there's a spirit attached to it. I think Trevor, I feel sure, will probably get into this. And, um, but, but, a, but a spirit, when it attaches to us, it will just it's psychological warfare. It will conv- in other words, there's nothing about the human body that needs another drink of liquor. There, there's nothing. Uh, you can say, well, it sets up this uh, emotion. It sets up this chemical and that chemical and all of the other. But I say there's something greater than that. And that spirit is trying to convince you that you need it. Can, can you hear what I'm saying? When somebody wants me, is trying to convince me to dislike somebody, for some reason I have these big warning flags go up. Well, why are you spending so much time trying to convince me how bad this person is with information that I don't even know, right? All of a sudden I got all these flags go up. And so I start wondering, at this, and, and then, also, then it'll get to addictive or, or, or the behavior gets compulsive. There's a spirit pushing it. Is, is my point. Now, uh, the psyops uh, in battle, let's look at this. In Colossians 2a, beware any man spoil you through the philosophy of vain deceit. Anybody tell me what vain means? Empty. Huh? Futile, empty, empty vain, right? Uh, deceit after the traditions of men, after the remnants of the world, not after Christ. John 3, 7, 1 John. Little children, let no man deceive you that he doeth righteousness, is righteous, even as he is righteous. Now, here's the most impactful psyop in World War II. I'm going to give you another example. I think this one's really cool here. I say cool. It's, uh... Now, I want you to see something. American commanders orchestrated the leaking of false orders, leading the German high command to believe the Allied D-Day invasion would be launched on the beaches of Calais rather than Normandy. So what happened, most of those armed forces went to the wrong beach. <laughs> Psyops. Our government did that to get the enemy to go to the wrong beach. They knew it was coming. But, it, but here's the point I want you to get on to, to, to see here. Beware of information generated from a leak. <laughs> Do I make my point? Have you noticed, now you see, in psychological, in psyops, they understand the fallen nature of man always wants to know something that's none of their business. You can say amen right there. Uh, now, the, psychological warfare knows that. The loss, the human nature of lost man loves a secret. We hunger for it. Almost die for it. Well, in psyops, you take advantage of that. And so you have a leak. Instead of making an announcement, we have now heard Roe versus Wade's probably going to pass in the near future. Instead of making an announcement, you have a leak. 
Why? Because the fallen nature of man loves a leak. So we'll run to it like it's a steak hot off the grill. We want to devour a leak. It's something I shouldn't know. I'll give you another example. Somebody comes up to you and says, you won't believe what I heard on the preacher. <laughs> That's a leak. Yeah, right? Yeah. What's, what's human nature? Instead of, instead of saying, you need to go back to hell where you came from with that information. <laughs> What is it? Yeah, I thought so. Yeah, I thought so. Listen, Christians, we got to understand what we're hearing and what we're seeing. Beware of leaks. As soon as I heard Roe versus Wade was leaked out of the Supreme Court, I'm like, somebody get, are, are we that dumb? A leak out of the Supreme Court. It should be tighter than Fort Knox. A, a little leak. We had a leak. Just so happens the leak. Well, if we got to blame leak, why didn't they leak something else sooner? Right? It's psychological warfare. Now, anybody with a little bit of a pea brain knows they were trying to cause a lot of disturbance to get the the, the judges to change their mind. I mean, that's that's that you had pressure even went on their, uh, to their houses and demonstrated, which is against the law, <clears throat> which they were not protected. And they, you know, they're still doing it. So somebody leaked it, but you got to understand that's done on purpose with a purpose. That's my point. So as Christians, we got to beware of what's going on. When God speaks, He doesn't leak. He announces Repent, he says. And if we got time, we'll get into a little of that. <laughs> Leaking is usually done on purpose with a purpose in mind. There it is. Court leak stokes abortion fight. In the, there's the news, uh, some of the news headings. Can you see that? So it was done on purpose. But thank God it didn't Sway. Now, the, one of the problems is it didn't sway the vote, but it did sway some people. They might have lost that battle, but they gained ground in the war. Now, watch this. The goal is to control the narrative. Now, this is what we've got to see. <clears throat> the goal in PSYOPs, psychological warfare, <clears throat> whether it be your own internal dialogue, or the narrative of a church or a narrative of a country. The goal is to control the narrative. To a Christian, now please hear that. I just, uh, if I say anything today, please get that. If I say anything in the next hundred years, please get that one statement. <clears throat> the goal is to control the narrative. In your internal conversations, of who you are, the, the, the idea is who's controlling the narrative. So if something, somebody says something about you and you're here, then you're getting a conversation, you get mad and you get upset. Uh, something's controlling your narrative and it's not God. That's the goal. Hey, anybody with me? How does somebody slander and how does somebody slander others or or to try to destroy the church of Jesus Christ, or try to destroy anything. It's, it's according to who's controlling the narrative of your heart. So understand that psychological warfare is about the narrative. Now, let, let me show you why that's so important. What you say is important. And what you say comes out of your narrative. Because, now, believe it or not, what you say is creative. And I'm not saying that you're God, but we're created in His image. God said, let there be light. What happened? There was light. Why? The, the example is, words are creative. Now, a lot of Christians say, well, I'm just going to sit back. I'm not going to say nothing. <laughs> you coward. You need to get saved. You need to get born again. 
the narrative carries your heart. The country is the narrative. That's what persuades people. It's words. They are creative in nature. You got to see that. Because Christians are just laying back, waiting for God to take over. And when he's put us here, is to be the voices of his kingdom. Now, let's watch this. The goal is to control the narrative. Anything in life, the enemy's speaking to your heart. Why? He's trying to control the narrative of your heart. Why? Because what comes out of your heart, so is he. If he controls the narrative of your heart, he'll control your life because your words are creative. That's why. Words are very creative. Now, definition of the narrative. A spoken or written account of a connected, uh, a connected event is a story that creates the narrative. So the enemy is constantly trying to create a narrative. Uh, our country is, is on the onslaught, on the movement of changing the whole narrative of our country. The whole history the story is the narrative. Now, I don't care if our story's good or bad, but our story's our story. If it's bad, we need to learn from it, right? You can't change it. You learn from it. So it's important not to change the true narrative. Just, just get that in your brain. Now, whoever controls the narrative controls the person or the country. Can you see now why leaked information is such a controlling thing in spiritual warfare? Can, can you see why the Bible tells us not to gossip about each other? We're to love each other, pray for each other, not talk about each other. It's amazing to me as Christians how we... Uh, oh, I ain't going there. Okay, Lord. The battle is for who controls the narrative of your mind and our country. The goal of PSYOPs is to control from within. The goal of psychological warfare, the goal of spiritual warfare is to control, but it does it from within. Right? You're, in other words, you look at your life and you can tell, we're so worried about, well, am I saved or am I not saved? I mean, the, the, the deal is who's controlling your life? Who's controlling your narrative? Why does it say give your heart to Christ? Because that's the narrative of your life. I mean, some of us have got a, a crappy narrative and we can't understand why everything's going so bad. I'm a farmer, so I can use that word. And, 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 and you've got to understand, what, your life follows your narrative. That's right. <clears throat> now, let's remember something. Now, this one I heard from a, a guy in... Uh, uh, Bethel, I forget which teacher it was now. Oh, who? Chris Valentin, that's who it is. Uh, he said this, and it, it, it shook my tree. I knew he was right. God is in charge, but we are in control. Now, of course, you've got to see that teaching to fully understand that. Uh, understand, but, you know, God has put us here in dominion over the earth with him. <clears throat> so we are in control of a lot of things, and in our Christian understanding, our Christian teaching, we get mixed up. Uh, <clears throat> understanding and, and dissecting what this con, uh, control means. We're to give control of our heart over to Christ, but you're in control of your life. Amen. You're in control of the narrative that's in your heart and your life. Now, but God, if God was in control, you wouldn't be seeing everything you're seeing. Exactly. What you're seeing on this planet is because we're in control, mankind. <clears throat> now, let's move quickly. How do I have success in this battle of the mind? Anybody interested? Very important. The first thing I'm going to put up here is uh, discipline. <clears throat> now, in Christianity, we want to do everything but discipline. If you want to have success in psyops, if you want to have success, now if you want to be tossed around by everything, this is not for you. Um, I mean... If you, do, if you need to go to the gym and work out and you don't have enough discipline to get in the car and go to the gym and work out, do you think because you have good intentions that it's going to change your health and your body? 
That was my teaching of two weeks ago. Good intentions doesn't get the job done. Good intentions fools you. You just use psyops on yourself. You've been, you've been fooled. <clears throat> discipline, Hebrews 12, 11. And no discipline seems pleasant at the time. Can somebody say amen? amen. But painful, another amen. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Now this is, there again, how to have success in the battle of the mind. Uh, some of us aren't having the success we need. You need to listen to this. First thing we got to have is discipline. It's hard work. It's going to feel painful. I, uh, my daddy taught me this when I was a young teenager and I've done it ever since. Not, I've been slack at times, but more or less it never left me. He said, son, always have one discipline you're practicing at a t all the t through your whole life. Then, then change from one to the another, next one, then to the next. He said, always have a discipline you're training yourself in your life for your entire life. Always do something you need to do but you don't want to do in your whole life. That's what he told me. And so what happens is, as Christians, we tend not to be disciplined. So when a huge crisis comes or something happens and Satan throws us something, gives us a huge blow up, because we haven't practiced discipline, when we get right into the heat of battle, we can't stand. We can't make it. Now, that's one way we win the battle of the mind. Now, here's another, Proverbs 12, 1. Whoever loves discipline loves knowledge, but he who hates correction is... Now, that's not my word. That's the Bible's word. Is stupid. Okay? A lot of people, if I use that word, they say, well, Alan, you're a little harsh. So, therefore, I'll just use the Bible. Uh, it's stupid. Now, how do I have success in this battle of the mind? The second thing is Passion. Discipline and passion. People with natural talent and perfect physical bodies are a dime a dozen. Hmm. Just so happens I, I'm not in that dime, but nonetheless, they're a dime a dozen. People with passion for truth are much harder to find. That's right. People with passion for... If you don't have a passion for truth... In the church house of God, there's where you got to start. When you lose your passion. Not, now, this is if you want to win in spiritual warfare. You got to have passion. If you don't have passion to defeat the enemy, he's going to defeat you. You got to have a passion for truth. That's the reason truth can't be negotiated, because you have a passion that's truth's true. I mean, my heart goes out to uh, ladies that have abortions and for all the reasons, and my heart goes out to you if you've had one. I love you. But I have a passion for the truth. And the passion of the truth is, thou shalt not kill. Now, I have passion for someone who's had an abortion, but my passion for the truth is the greatest passion. And sometimes it makes you look harsh. Makes you look like you have no feeling. Looks like you, it makes you, but there again, it's, it's where's your greater passion? Now, let's move on here. Passion for truth will outdo natural talent every time. Somebody with me? You can get into psychological warfare and negotiations, but a passion for the truth will cut through all of that malarkey. That's right. You can't move. Passion, definition, strong and barely controllable emotion. That's what passion is. <laughs> there were several different ones. That's the one I picked. Uh, definition, strong and barely controllable emotion. Jeremiah 6, 16 says this. Now watch it. This is what the Lord says. Stand at the crossroads and look. Now watch this verse. Ask for the ancient paths. Ask where the good way is and walk in it and you will find rest for your souls. But you said, we will not walk in it. You see that? The Lord says, stand at the crossroads and look. 
That's what he says. He says, stand, stand at the crossroads, forks of the road here. He said, now take a look. He said, find the ancient paths. You say, well, Alan, how will I know which one? It's passion. Passion is what shows you that. Now, let's move on quickly here. Now, psyops is mental warfare. In mental warfare, you must understand that you win in advance. All right, I'm going to show you how this thing works. If you wait till you're in the battle to convince yourself you're going to win, you're too late. It's just too late. Can anybody hear what I'm trying to tell you? I'm telling you about spiritual warfare and how you fight it. In, sight, in mental warfare, in spiritual warfare, you must understand that you win in advance. Can, can anybody hear that? We sit in here and we learn and we teach and we read God's Word and we worship God. Why? It's preparedness for our next crisis. You know, if you're real about life, you go from crisis to crisis to crisis. But God's preparing us to stand in this warfare. Is the enemy against us and causing a lot of it? Yeah. You can say, well, you, you, you cause a lot of them. Yeah, but it's because the enemy controlled your narrative. That you find you in the mess you're in. It's still the enemy. You're still trying to destroy. Now watch this. If you can go with me, we're going to try this one. Are you kind of with me there so far? All right, all right you've got to win it in advance. It says this in Ephesians 6, 12, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual weaknesses in high places. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had power over of death, and that is the devil. Now, the way we win in advance is we believe that. It, it just so happens we're always waiting for God to prove that that's true. Now, this is tough. How do we win in advance? The way we win in advance is we believe that Christ took care of it on the cross. So we have to maintain this mental attitude. Can anybody hear me? Yeah. We have to maintain this mental attitude even though everything's coming against us to not maintain that narrative. So as the narrative goes, it controls how we speak and how we speak controls what happens in our life. Now watch this. How to win in advance. Choose your feeling before you feel. Now, I know people's going to have trouble with that one. I know you are. It's just okay. It's all right. You see, you thought feeling was an afterthought. And the Bible says the feeling comes first. There again, you want to win in advance? You got to choose your feeling before the battle. You can say, well, Alan, I had never thought about it that much. That's the reason I'm teaching it. <coughs> you don't wait to have the feeling when you're in the battle. You choose your feeling before the battle. <coughs> what that means is totally gird up your mind. We, we're under this idea that the way we feel has everything to do with what's happening around us. We, are, we have been brainwashed to that definition. Now, it just so happens we yield to that one 99% of the time, so therefore we're convinced that that's the law of feelings. Have you ever seen anybody be in a, in a crisis or somebody get in an argument and your opponent just stays cool, calm, and collected? You can't sway them? Why? It's because they already chose their feelings. Did you know when you choose your feeling before the battle that the feeling you choose is spiritual in nature? You know, people make fun of it. What would Jesus do? 
I wouldn't make too much fun of it because that's the feeling. What would Jesus do? All right, I'm getting ready to go into this or whatever. Now, I'm going to go into the, in the places that we can prepare for feeling, and then we'll go into places where we can't prepare for feeling, but we're going to feel just the same. Now, let's watch this. Hey, now, this is how you win. You, you got to win in advance, and this is how you win in advance is you choose your feeling before you feel. The mind is the ground where all battles are won or lost, and it is the only battleground that you have full control over from start to finish. Now, I started not to put that up there uh, because I'm talking about control. If you understand the narrative and the battle for the narrative of the soul and of the mind, you'll understand that statement. You are in control of the battle ground from start to finish. You got to understand how the enemy works. Now there again, the mind is the ground where all battles are won or lost. And it is the only battleground that you have full control over from start to finish. You're like, Alan, bring me definition to that. Everyday life is where you train yourself to control your mind. That's what everyday life is. Everyday life is designed to train us to control our minds. Discipline. Everybody just wants to free will. Well, this is the way our feet. Do you not understand the political correctness and all this jargon you got going on today is because people are free willing at the mind level? Total emotion. Our emotions can come under the subjection of Christ. Yes, they can. If you're a man wanting another man's wife, your emotions have gone awry. Right? You don't have any problem with that. But let's look at the other areas that that can happen. How to win in advance. Practice controlling your mind during small challenges such as work or family gatherings. I could have left out family <laughs> gatherings, but that was the big one. It just so happens I, as I was preparing that, that, I had a phone call, and that's what it was about. I said, okay, I'm going to make use out of that one. Uh, soon you'll find that it is easier than you thought. Once you realize what I'm saying, and we put it into practice, you'll realize uh, that it's easier than you thought. Not only that, let me tell you this. A lot of you have done it in times past, but you've gotten lazy. And this teaching is to make you wake up again. All right, get back into this thing. Let's, 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 look at, let's do some housekeeping. Let's get back. Once you're familiar with controlling your mind and directing your feelings, you are ready for the battle. Then you're ready. Now, I'm just pointing these things out, even though everybody's done it to a percentage, I'm sure, maybe not fully. But then I'm saying it out loud there again. It should give it full throttle on what we need to do as we enter into this psyops age that we're living in. The goal of the enemy is to throw you off emotionally. Are you with me? That's his goal. <clears throat> if, you're, if, you're, if you're in hand-to-hand -hand combat, the, the main thing is... If you can throw your opponent off balance, they're very easy to take down. Are you with me? Same thing in the spirit world. The goal of the enemy is to throw you off emotionally. So we've got to have control of our mind, our feelings. Your feelings have got to be subject to Christ. You are now not your own. You didn't come to Christ for him to make you happy. That's right. He loves you. But so did my daddy. He said every time he gave me a whipping. <laughs> Mental attacks are attempts to defeat you and throw you off balance. That's, it's, it's, that's the goal. You must remain focused on your objective. Now that's if you want to be a soldier in this battle of the mind, in this psyops that's going on. When you watch the news, you need to have enough sense to know what's true and what's not true. Okay? Now watch this. 
Now, here's what we're going to do, how to win. We're going to confuse the enemy with the Word of God. This will instill fear in your opponent. Now, come on now, somebody. This is the truth. We don't run from the enemy. We run into the enemy. That's right. Now, now watch it. Confuse the enemy with the Word of God. You're going to get him off balance. It affects him, the Word of God. This will instill fear in your opponent. The Word of God scares the bejeebies out of the devil and his cohorts. All right? We got fear. Well, it, we're going to give you some fear, big buck. Now, watch this. When faced with a mental assault, stay calm because the enemy reads your reactions for his next move. I'm trying to give you play by play what happens. Are you with me? When faced with a mental assault, stay calm because the enemy reads your reactions for his next move. He's watching you. That's the reason you got to be disciplined. That's the reason you got to control your feelings. Because the enemy uses that. Let me give you a little something else here quickly. Our enemy is a bully and will read you like a book. Let him know you are more than able to fight him with the Word of God. You got to see something. The enemy's a bully. He's a bully. He's a bully. Now, he'll read us like a book. You got to let him know that you'll fight him with the Word of God. Now, watch this one right quickly. Bullies smell fear and advance upon their prey when it is present. Now, do you see the reason for discipline? You're going to pick your feelings up front. You see why? It's be, listen, I'm not kidding. The enemy smells fear. He's a bully. If he sees he's being fearful over you, he's coming on hot and heavy. You pray uh, when it is present. Bullies also smell strength and power and will leave you alone or obey your commands. Bullies also understand strength. That's reason when you're dealing with a Putin, I'm sorry. I didn't have to say that. <laughs> strength is the only thing that bully's going to listen to. Come on. That's right. you, you can negotiate all you want to. Show fear. Oh, I'm going to cut your water off. <laughs> like he cares. Now, I'm just telling you, a bully... He smells strength and power too. So is our enemy on the dark side. He'll leave you alone and obey your commands when you speak the word of God. Now, that's true. I'm trying to prepare the people of God here that, that want to take this thing on, that at least want to stand. Now watch this. Be the person who radiates the glory of God. That's what you're after. One that doesn't fear anyone except God. That's our only fear. Colossians 1.27. To whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of his mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. One other thing. Now, I'll have to end on this one. I haven't got anywhere where I was wanting to go, but believe it or not, if I live next week, <laughs> we're going to be on deceive, deception, all right? Now, I want you to catch something here. Now, you got to catch this. You are stronger than you think you are. Can somebody say amen? amen? You really are. Look here. I can do all things through Christ Jesus, which strengthens me. Can you see why your internal narrative is so important? How does this come alive in me? Because it's in the book? No, because the book's in me. Yes. It's my narrative. It comes off of a claim into an ownership. You say, well, Alan, that looks a little cocky. You blame right. In Jesus, I'm cocky. Why? Because I can do how many things? That's a pretty cocky statement. You can do all things. Through Christ who strengthens me. So you're stronger Please receive that than you think you really are. You know more than you think you know. 
Now come on here, Philippians 2, 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. There again, it's got to come off this book. It's got to get in here. Can you see why you got to be a, a disciplined person who chooses her feelings up front? You win the battle before in advance. Christians win battles in advance. You got to see that. We don't wait till the battle comes. Let this mind be in you. You're, you're, you know more than you think. <clears throat> you can do more than you think you can. Same one, but at the beginning, <clears throat> I can do all things through Christ. You see that? All right, I'm going to have to stop there today. I want you to understand this is how you, you got you to understand that dialogue there. I'm going to start here next week. Uh, boy, I'm telling you, this, uh, this is going to be good. <laughs> Elijah won in advance because of his discipline, <coughs> his passion, and his faith in God. I want you to see that. <coughs> Elijah won in advance. <coughs> and I'll stop on this one. And here's what faith is. Faith is an act of knowing in advance. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So you, you see, all of a sudden, faith takes on a deeper meaning. Faith is winning in advance. In Jesus' name. Lord God, be with us, I pray. Be with us as we go into worship. Be with us, oh God, in our worship and in this next teaching. Anoint Trevor. Give him the wisdom of your word. Give him revelation that we need to hear, that we might apply it to our lives. I ask and pray, oh God, that this congregation, that they be called as warriors of the faith, of that in this battle we find ourselves in the psyops of the Spirit. I pray, oh God, that we would not be fooled, that we could tell the truth from a lie, and that we would rise up and we would stand for your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.